What does the third eye have to do with attunement? Well, the third eye is the center of spiritual perception. And attunement is blending our conscious mind with our spirit. So when we perceive from the spiritual view, then the process of decision making, which the third eye is the key to good decision making, becomes natural. The more we develop the third eye, the more simple things that we didn't think would inspire us do. When you use your third eye, you don't conform. You have this deeper attunement to what's right for you. Hi everyone, welcome back. I'm Michael Sandler, your host on Inspire Nation. If you've ever wanted to get more in greater alignment with your spiritual self, then do we have the Infinite View show for you. Today I'll be talking with Ellen Tad, internationally known clairvoyant counselor and educator for over 40 years and the best-selling author of The Wisdom of the Chakras, Death and Letting Go, and her latest book filled with way too much goodness for just one book, The Infinite View. And that's just what I want to talk with her about today, about how to get an alignment and attunement for our greatest lives here on Earth. That plus we'll talk about Kabuta tractors, shufflers and zoomers, souls and toaster ovens, why in the world you can't be a, become a rock star if you don't know the chords, and how in the world to rent an office on Newbury Street for only $200 a month. So welcome to the show, Ellen. Are you ready to shine? <laughs> Absolutely. Well, thanks for being here and a mighty woohoo! So before we dive right into things, could you tell us what you were able to see when you were a little girl? Well, you know... It I had a variety of different experiences. Um, I think I was considered an overly sensitive child, mm -hmm. and it was a combination of feeling other people's feelings. Um, at night, I um, I saw faces in the dark, and I saw energy around people. I write in my book that my father was a physicist, and I said to him that I could see molecules and. He took me to an electron microscope to show me molecules, and I knew I wasn't seeing molecules, and then I got scared that something was wrong with me. And I was seeing energy, auras, and beings in the etheric form. And so I slept with my light on mm -hmm. because I, I felt afraid. And I think it's unfortunate that in our culture, all too often, the concept of etheric beings is the boogeyman rather than the angelic um, teacher or support. And so I just didn't have a frame of reference in which to understand what was happening to me. And I also had some out-of-body experiences where I would feel the spinning and then I would have my spirit leave my body. And, you know, it was all very confusing because there was, I didn't have anyone around me who could explain what I was experiencing. Oh, thank you for sharing. Now, oftentimes people who have these experiences when they're young, uh, sort of like kids who have somebody there that they're speaking to who is called an imaginary friend and then they're told it's not real and then it goes away because they're told it's not right to have. How are you able to hold on to this during your early years? Well, it did go away. It did go away, and yet in my natural philosophical nature, I wanted to understand the meaning of life, and it was very hard for me to just think about a career and, and a life without a deeper understanding, because I grew up with a mother who had a severe case of MS, and I wanted to understand why is one person sick and one person healthy and one person rich and one person poor, it seemed to me that in nature there was profound order and that there must be order to our lives as well because we're part of nature. But I, I didn't know. I, I really was struggling. And so my watershed event was when I was 19, my mother came back and talked to me after she died. And that's when everything changed. And I say in my book, my mother gave me birth and my mother gave me rebirth because after that experience, I started to see and remember that we're all spirit temporarily on the earth. Woohoo! There's, <laughs> there's a line that you mentioned that's just so profound. You say, if you look deep enough, there are always reasons and justice. Yes, and that was the quote from my mother. 
And that I never tire of that phrase because before that I felt that life was cruel and didn't make any sense to me. And, and I, I suffered emotionally because of that. And once I started to understand that this is a school, we come here to learn there are reasons why things transpire. There's reincarnation. I started to be able to experience the purpose and the reasons. I, I had, uh, I was going to say as a kid, I guess it was a kid at this point, I was trying to make it to the Tour de France as a bicycle racer many, many years ago. And I got, I remember in the French Alps, I was waved through a blind turn into an oncoming car and was hit head on by a woman in a full-size Peugeot, an elderly woman in her car. And I remember laying on the ground thinking, God is dead. There is no God. Life is cruel. Now looking back 20, 25 years later, it was one of the greatest gifts in the world, but I couldn't tell it at the time. So until your, your mom, she, I guess she went blind when you were eight, and then a better part of your childhood, she couldn't have even been there much for you. Were you having these feelings until she passed away and come back that none of this makes any sense anymore? Well, she actually woke up blind when I was two, oh, wow. and her sight came back, but from that experience, she was diagnosed with, with MS. And then, you know, she had a very severe case, so it affected both her body and her mind. And so I really watched her fall apart, and she had been a star athlete, so she had been really very vital. And so the contrast and the speed in which she fell apart was, was really shocking and created a trauma in our family. And so, you know, I, I wanted to understand why. But I didn't know if I believed in life after death. I was not raised with any religion. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so I actually went around to churches when I was young, because I was looking for answers. And I, I wasn't satisfied with what I was hearing. And so I, I really feel so incredibly uh, fortunate that I had this experience where my mother really heard my call and came back to me. So she died when I was 17 and then came to me when I was 19. And, and then after that, it was like a veil was lifted in this natural sensitivity I had and visionary ability. I stopped fighting. I stopped pushing it away. I stopped being afraid of it, and I started to welcome it. What is, uh, if you don't mind sharing, then what is? And I, I know I'm going to pronounce this wrong. Hand scrying, or no, scrying? Exactly right, hand scrying. Okay. Um, well, um, so I learned purely by accident that when I stare into a person's hand, I start having visions of their previous incarnations, and I learned this because the very night that my mother came back and talked to me, I was in um, the medium's apartment. The medium happened to be my brother's girlfriend at the time. And she um, let me stay in her apartment and I couldn't sleep because I realized I'm never alone. All my thoughts are known, all my behaviors are known. At mm -hmm. first I felt pretty embarrassed about that. Now I feel comforted. It's a very different perspective. But I couldn't sleep all night, so I went to the bookshelf and I pulled out a book on palmistry and I read it in that one night. And the next day I started looking at hands and I started having visions. And so I, I um, saw visions of people in past costumes and locations and I was able to feel the emotional quality of their lives and I was able to tell them and so I discovered purely by accident that I was reading the soul and then 10 years after that experience I learned the term hand scrying which mm -hmm. is reading the soul through the hands and now you know I've done I've done 30,000 sessions looking into people's hands so I've had this this broad experience of seeing how much our past lives impact our current life it's not the main focus of today's interview, but it, it is worth considering because it's something I was mentioning off air that I do a lot of automatic writing. And it's something I've been hearing more and more about how you get to challenge when, when you act a funny way. And we're humans. We all act strange. It's part of the human experience. But you get to ask the question, A, whose is this? 
or where did this come from? And oftentimes it's not even this lifetime. And that's what I think you're saying as well. When you say, where does this come from? You mean the knowledge that you're writing down? No, the, the, I, I end up having in an automatic writing a discussion to try to understand why a particular, let's say, neurosis, why I have a particular fear or I get see. upset about something or have a reaction that is disproportionate to a logical, if there is such a thing, emotional reaction. Yes. Absolutely. Our past lives affect us enormously. We're a sum total of all that we have been at the level of the soul. And that's both our, our strengths and our weaknesses, our fears and our talents. You know, people talk about someone having a, a gift, well, a musical gift or any kind of gift. It's, I don't really see it as a gift. I see it having been developed and achieved in a previous life. And then it carries over. Now, you mentioned that in the book that uh, your brother was maybe a little bit better at music than you were. Yes, because he had that history in his soul. Exactly. Can you tell us from there how you met your first spirit guide? Well, as I said, I saw faces in the dark as a child, but I didn't know, um, you know what that meant. But the first conscious connection was... Um, I was home with the flu, actually. I was quite sick. I think I'd been in bed for a couple of weeks. And I think what allowed me to open to the experience was that I was too tired to think. I like and it. And opens us to the spiritual world is really a meditative state or a non-analytical state, an openness and a non-thinking state. And so at 3 o'clock in the morning – when I had had this flu, I was woken up, and there above me was a magnificent Asian man in etheric form. Well, for those who has, have not experienced seeing etheric form, it looks just like the physical, except it's scintillating. There's more light. There's, um, you know, we know in biology that our arm is not solid. It's moving energy even though it appears solid to us, well, the etheric form is moving energy, just like the physical, except it's moving faster. And so in some ways, you can say clairvoyance is the ability to see the faster moving energy. And I have found that when we're in a meditative state, our ability to see and experience this faster moving energy is enhanced. So this first experience with this Asian guide left me feeling loved, protected. Uh, it was an incredible experience. That experience didn't really have any message to mm -hmm. it. Uh, but later he started to come to me and teach. And, you know, I, I really had a 10 year period of being taught and I lived a very, um, simple life in the country. I lived on a dead end dirt road and I was immersed in a spiritual education. How were you able to, how are you able to dive deep into your practice? And I'm guessing that's what it was, a practice rather than to be distracted by the bells and whistles of the rest of the world. Well, that's a big and interesting question. Um, you know, very quickly, because of hand scrying, I got a profession. So I remember um, an old friend of mine invited me to a conference called Your Psychic Self. Mm -hmm. And I had never worked professionally. I had just looked into my friend's hands and my family's hands or someone I knew was having trouble. I would look into their hand. And so I wrote a little blurb and I got such an incredible response that I, out of the whole conference, I was the most popular, and I realized I had a career. And so it, it came overnight. So the reality is that, you know, I, I've always been self-employed. I've always done this work from a very young age. So um, it afforded me the opportunity to learn from my guides. I never advertised. People found me. And so I could meet the financial needs of my family mm -hmm. and continue to be immersed in this learning. So I had a, a kind of um, separation from the culture 
for a while. And there was like 10 years where I didn't see a movie. You know, it was, um, they were trying to recondition me. They say that we have two fundamental challenges in being able to actualize our spiritual nature. One is our past life traumas or um, confusions that are not resolved. Mm -hmm. And the other is our cultural conditioning that doesn't support our spiritual nature. And they actually say that our cultural conditioning is our bigger hurdle. Because if the environment and the culture and the people support the actualization of our spirit, then the soul traumas heal and unravel. But when the culture does not, then what happens is it adds insult to injury and it creates a lot of confusion. So they really removed me from the culture for a period of time because they wanted me to learn what was universal and what was unique. They wanted me to learn more of a universal understanding and not get confused by by a confused culture. That makes sense. And I'm going to want in a minute to dive into understanding that since we don't, most of us don't have the ability to step back that much, so to speak, at the end of the dirt road, but maybe yes. internally we do. Before that, what happened when you watched your son incarnate? The story of watching my son incarnate? Yeah. Well, I think it it still moves me when I think about it. I think it was one of the most profound experiences I've ever had. Um, so um, I, I saw my son appear at the foot of my bed um, when I started to go into labor. And on each side of him was a being of light. And I remember, and I write about this in my book, I was thinking, oh, I'm going to have a short labor. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and he said to me in thought, because the language from the spiritual world is telepathy. Mm -hmm. And in thought, he said, I've just come to see if you are all right. And I thought, oh, good, I'm going to have a considerate son. And I told him I was. And then it was a very long labor. And on the way to the hospital the second time, he appeared again to me, but this time he, it appeared as if he was standing up in the car. So I learned that in the spiritual world, there isn't really a size. People can appear in a variety of different um, sizes or forms. And um, so from the top of his head and the bottom of his feet, his etheric body dissolved, and all that was left was a beam of white light which entered the new child. And then in a couple of hours, he was born. And it was so clear to me that he wasn't mine. And I felt such compassion for everyone because we've all done this. We've all left a realm where we can travel at the speed of thought and manifest with thought and come into a physical body where we experience a different kind of limitation. That's, I mean, there's obviously this incredible love for a child, but that means that there's a compassion as well as a, you chose to come here with all the struggles that you've about to be, uh, about to be given. That is huge. Yes. <laughs> So this wonderful sense of oneness at the spiritual level, but also a unity at the human level. What does that mean? It means that at the human level, we, we share a commonality. We all have lessons. We all have challenges. We all experience suffering. And yet at a spiritual level, we're unlimited. Where The way I've been taught to think of it is we are one small creation and we are the creator. We're both. And this ability to experience individuality and unity at the same time is part of what we're here learning. Woohoo! <laughs> <laughs> Can you tell us what is the first error and the beginning of the karmic snowball? You did read my book. Oh, of course. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, so. Some real basics I was taught was about the relationship between the spirit, the soul, and the personality. Mm -hmm. So I was told that everyone has a spirit, a spark of the God force. This is our enlightened self. This is the part of our self that doesn't change, doesn't evolve. It's the only constant. And then over the spirit is the soul. The soul is the container of the spirit. 
that allows us to have individuality and animation. And the soul is very complicated. It contains all of our past life patterns, traumas, talents, and skills that have accumulated through all of the many lives we've lived. And I've been taught that within the soul, there's a concept called first error, which is the original attitude that was not in harmony with our spiritual nature. My guides call it the beginning of the karmic snowball. And in Christianity, I think they call it original sin, except from my visions and in my education, what I've learned is it's not the same for everyone. We have our own brand of fear and confusion. It's not identical. And so the process of tracing people back to understanding what the deepest issue is, it's like what I call the lowest common denominator lesson. And this is this first error. And just as we all have uniqueness in our spiritual nature, we have uniqueness in this fundamental lesson we're working on. And then my guides say that the personality is over the soul. And the personality contains our genetics, Mm -hmm. conditioning from parents, society and education, past life influences, and then influence from the spiritual essence. They say that fulfillment is when the spiritual essence manifests at the personality level. And this is so key because culturally we're taught fulfillment comes from getting what we want. And then if we don't get what we want, we're sad or we're mad or we're hurt. And then we become victims of circumstance. Can you share that that expression about fulfillment one more time and maybe even give a short example of what that looks like? So fulfillment is the ability to actualize our spiritual nature with consistency. Mm -hmm. And that when we recognize that this is fulfillment, then what's most important is how we're being, not what's happening to us. I'll give an example. So um, there's someone I know who um, I've worked with, and she's very capable. And the conditioning from her mother is to, you know, use her fine intelligence to, um, you know, be an executive and to be successful in the world and to um, uh, be part of an organization where she'd have security and success monetarily. But her spiritual nature is creativity. And so as she's been climbing the corporate ladder, she's Mm -hmm. been unhappy. And as I worked with her and explained that her spiritual nature is about creativity and that if she's going to have a happy and fulfilled life, her watchword is creativity and she needs to focus on it. And she shifted now. She's now working creatively and she's so much happier because we don't want to be a round peg trying to fit in a square hole. The process of accepting who we are in our spirit. I often say if our spirit is nurturing and we want it to be creativity, we're out of luck. This essential part of our nature is what we're here to manifest. And the other phrase I like from my guides is it's our particular instrument in the orchestra of life that we're here to play. Beautiful. So along those lines, maybe you can tell us more about cultural impediments and the instruments we're not meant to play. (laughs) Well, um, you know, if I didn't believe that I was spirit, if I hadn't experienced it, and many people through our educational system are taught that we're human and that what, what really is linked to our makeup is genetics and environment, nature and nurture. And I always tell people that if that were true, it is our parents' fault if we don't like something about ourselves because they give us our genetics and they give us our early environment in most cases. But when you see this broader view of reincarnation, just as I met my son before he was my son, people bring in their own propensities prior to being born into a specific family. So I think that very conditioning that people are made up from genetics and environment creates a lot of problems 
I'm having an ooga booga goosebump experience because this morning I was at the gym with my wife. We're working out and she goes, oh, there's that song again. We like that artist. And it's it's somebody, uh, we looked up, there's a TV in the gym and I think it was the, the artist's name is Rag in Bones. The song is called Human and he was singing a line, something to the effect of... Um, I'm, I'm just human, or it's not my fault, I'm just human. I'm just, basically, I'm just human. There's nothing I can do about it. I am as I am because I'm just human. Well, I would disagree with that. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the idea, you know, see, the other thing that happens when people perceive themselves as just human or genetics and environment, then there's this feeling that, we can't change. But when we see ourselves as spirit with this magnificent potential, then the very process of being on the earth is all about change. It's all about evolution. It's all about working through fears and, and expanding one's conception of what's possible. I, I can't help but go there. But and and I was I was diagnosed as well. The official term was probably squirrel on crack when I was uh, diagnosed with ADHD multiple times as a child and medicated and all that fun stuff. Your brother had a different route that was, fortunately was available to him. He became a long distance runner instead. Yes. Well, I think I'm probably older than you, and my brother is older than me. So this was a phase where medicating children really was not part of the culture at that time. And I just use him as an example because, you know, he had a nickname of, of rumpus because he was so full of energy that he couldn't sit still. And, you know, this is not a bad thing. And when children are expected to sit in the classroom, when it may not be natural to them, then there needs to be other ways to um, help channel the nature of a child. And my brother, you know, running, I mean, he's done wonderful things as a coach and um, in the quality of his own life. And it came from this incredible vitality he had that made it hard for him to sit still. Woohoo! <laughs> what is what your guides call attunement? Well, attunement is aligning our conscious mind with our spirit. So within each of us, we have this spiritual God force essence or enlightened self, and it's the process of consciously aligning with it, aligning with it in how we feel, mm -hmm. aligning with it in the decisions we make, so that we start narrowing the gap between our personality and our spiritual nature so that we start feeling, expressing, manifesting more and more our deepest essence. How do we start to get into attunement? Well, the two fundamental ways I teach are deep listening and deep focus. If you think about our physical senses, every physical sense can go an octave deeper. So there's the hearing of sound, but then there's deep listening that goes beyond sound. So in other words, when someone is talking, there's what the words are. If someone says, I love you, it can be full of anxiety or it can be full of passion or it can be full of tenderness. The ability to listen beneath the sound to the message or the energy is a way to learn to access attunement. It's through depth. And this is where culturally, if people are rushing around and moving too fast, it's very hard to go into depth, that we stay superficial if we're rushing. And depth is this ability to, to listen and to focus. So I teach meditation <laughs> because meditation is the way to develop the skill of deep listening then can apply to daily life. And I teach the activation of the third eye chakra because this is the center of deep looking. 
It's the center of deep focus. And, you know, I'm not Christian any more than I'm any religion, but I love the phrase, if thy eye be single, the whole body will be filled with light. And I learned, and I have a whole chapter about this in my book, because I learned the hard way about the power of the third eye. My guides talk about learning to live life looking through your forehead. They say when you open two eyes, open three. Maybe you can share w more about us because you talk about us I and mean, your guides talk about us being in a, a solar plexus world and we need to shift our focus up. Yes. Well, I became interested in the chakra system about 10 years after my experience with my mother. And what motivated me to want to learn about the chakras was I wanted to understand human behavior. And I particularly wanted to understand why people are lopsided in their development. I, I have a phrase, which is a PhD kindergartner, where someone may be very adept in certain aspects of their life and very immature in other aspects. And, and sometimes I would get blindsided and shocked by that. And so I wanted to understand people more deeply. So I spent a period of time using my clairvoyance, watching chakras. And I didn't read books about them, although I had some basic understanding of what they were, but I just watched them. And I, as I said in my book, I became a chakra watcher for a while. And I learned a lot. Um, I read a little book called The Wisdom of the Chakras based on my fundamental conclusions. But what I try to tell everyone, because it was so significant, is in my observation of chakras, I observed that some people are focused in the solar plexus or the gut as they move through their lives and make decisions. Other people are focused in the third eye as they're moving through their lives. Of course, there are those who are flip-flopping back and forth. And then there are those who rely primarily on their analytical mind. And what I found, or were my conclusions, is that the analytical mind is like the computer. It's fabulous to have a fast computer. And, you know, growing up with a father who was a physicist and really a very, very intelligent person, I learned that he didn't necessarily make wise decisions. So I learned very early that having a very developed intellect does not necessarily mean wisdom. Just like you don't want to ask your computer, you know, who should I marry, right? <laughs> Because it's about data mm -hmm. and it's a great tool, just like our intellect is a great tool. It still shouldn't be how we make our decisions. And the sol solar plexus, which is the gut, and there are actually, you know, books about following your gut. My guides say this is a mistake. They say that the gut or the solar plexus is the center of emotion, feeling. And that feelings come from many places. Feelings can come from clarity. Feelings can come from fear. Feelings can come from preconceived notions. Feelings can come from absorbing other people's feelings. So the solar plexus is not the center of perception. It's the center of feeling. And they say perception informs feeling. How we perceive a situation informs mm -hmm. how we feel about it. And they say the third eye is the center of perception. And so this center of perception should inform our emotions. And they say the third eye is activated through focus and concentration alone. Period. Focus and concentration. Can you tell us then what's the TAD technique? Okay. So the TAD technique is a technique that developed over time which is the comparison of perception from the gut mm -hmm. with the perception of the third eye. And so the TAD technique is the comparison of these two forms of perception in order to learn the value of the third eye. So can you give us an example? Because I, I love to give people homework on this show. And, yes. and maybe we can give people homework to start to uh, perceive from the third eye after today. Well, I can teach the technique with eyes closed. Yeah, let's 
one way, and I can also teach it with eyes open. Which would you prefer? Let's do it with eyes closed. And if you're listening and you're driving down on the road, you, you can probably listen to this and wait to come back to it or double back later on. But this sounds like the more powerful way. Correct me if I'm wrong. No, they're different. I mean, when I first teach it, mm -hmm. I teach it with eyes closed because it helps people to focus. But ultimately, the most important thing is that we utilize this with eyes open because that's how we're living. But I think maybe what I can do is walk you through this exercise, see what you feel, and then everyone can practice too. Sounds okay? great. So close your eyes, put your palms down, and focus in the gut. So the gut, the solar plexus, is the area in your body where you feel butterflies when you're nervous. And I'd like you to put all your attention there. So as you put your attention in the solar plexus, I'd like you to imagine yourself late for an important appointment. You're focused in the solar plexus. You're late for an important appointment. What do you feel and what do you do? Keeping your eyes closed, talk it's, about it. It's kind of tight, and so to counter that, I start taking a deeper breath, trying to bring it down to my belly, to expand my belly, to get it to relax. So would you say that that tightness is an anxiousness? Yes. Oh, yeah. Okay. Anxious about being late. Okay, now turn your palms over, and I want you to tap the point in the middle of your forehead with your eyes closed. It's right there, exactly, right smack in the middle of the forehead. Some people think it's between the brows, but it's not. It's right in the middle of the forehead. Okay, perfect. Now put your hand down, and I'd like you to bring all your attention to that point in the middle of your forehead. Sometimes it's helpful to envision a round window, and you're looking out of the middle of your forehead. And as you look out of that point, I'd like you to hold your focus, not let it drop. And I'd like you to imagine the very same circumstance. You are late for an important appointment, but this time you're looking through your forehead. Talk to me about the difference in the experience and how you deal with being late. Oh, I'm being coached and guided as I do that, that it's okay, it's all right, life is good, there's nothing to worry about. And there's much more of a relaxed sense of beingness or a all is okay with the world. And you just get there when you can, right? Absolutely. So you don't have the tension, you don't have the anxiety, you have acceptance, and then you navigate wisely given the circumstance, correct? Sounds perfect. Sounds like that would be the choice I'd want to make. Yes, and one of the things I love is that when you go to the third eye, your aura gets brighter and bigger significantly, so you must feel more expansion, and that is a reflection of the attitude change into positivity. I want to ask more about that, but while my eyes are still closed, the first thought that came to me, and I don't know if it's because it's the shirt color I'm wearing today, was color pink, which it just felt like I was being blanketed in the color pink. Well, pink is a color of tenderness. You know, it's it's um, red with white. And so white is, you know, includes all colors and is the oneness. And so I, I think of pink as a real um, loving and tender color. It's nice to see a man wearing pink. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> I muscle test before each show and I say, what will I wear today? <laughs> 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 I love muscle testing. So we should try this, practice this with our eyes closed first so we can kind of get that contrast. And then we start to, in our day-to-day -day lives, particularly maybe, maybe this is good when we get into a difficult, more challenging situation. Those tend to be our best teachers. That's where if we can remember to go to our third eye, we may notice the biggest change. Yes. Yeah, so, so when your eyes are opened and you feel like a circumstance has punched you in the gut, you know, or you're anxious, one of the things to do, one trick is to find a point, the corner of a picture frame or the end of a sign or the 
end of a branch, find a point because focus and concentration will activate the third eye and emotional calm will return. And with that will come clarity of what to do. You know, in sports, athletes talk about the zone. Well, the zone is a profound level of focus. And in that level of focus, there is the ability to let go of the attachment to winning. And yet their best performance comes to the forefront. If we're in our third eye, we bring our best selves forward. I love that uh, we've interviewed several people on The Zone. We had on uh, Michael Jordan's mindfulness coach. And there's a talk among the coaches or among players who hit, like a, a professional basketball player who gets in the zone of, I was in such a flow, sense of such a state of grace, that I didn't care who won. I loved the other players. We were all one. And then, exactly. of course, the ball went in. <laughs> and so what I want people to know is is the technique of what's actually going on there. Because a lot of athletes get there, but they don't know how they got there, and then they don't know how to reproduce it. Mm -hmm. And essentially, it's the activation of the third eye. Thank you. Let's go from there, and, and we get to start to wrap things up soon, because I know I want to go through a meditation practice with you before the end. Why is positivity our greatest protection? <laughs> That's a quote from my guides. Positivity is our greatest protection. Well... Positivity, attitude, they define positivity as attitudes based in spiritual principles. Mm -hmm. Negativity are attitudes not based in spiritual principles. When we're negative, our auras shrink. When our auras shrink, we become psychic sponges. We start absorbing the feelings of others and we influence our environment because we're all energy and every thought and feeling we have spews out into the environment. When we cultivate positivity, the aura expands. We stop being overly affected by our environment and we start becoming a positive influence. So how do we start to, when we sense we're going down, how do we start to turn that around? Well, the third eye really helps because, you know, if you're in the solar plexus and you're feeling negative and you're trying to feel positive, it may just not work. But when you shift to the third eye, again, perception informs feeling. So as your perception changes, the process of moving into positivity isn't so difficult. So the third eye is a great aid in sustaining positivity. The other thing is the process of being vigilant and being self-observing and training the mind and not letting the mind run our lives, but us training the mind and using it as a tool. Thank you. Can you tell us real briefly about inspiration? Well, inspiration, think of it as in spirit. Inspiration is another really powerful tool. It's a tool that opens the crown chakra. So when we're inspired, we are uplifted, we are wowed, and my guides say that inspiration is the back door to trust. That when we're inspired, it's impossible to be anxious, it's impossible to be afraid, it cancels out the fear. So that Inspiration, I find, is the way that the most number of people can feel spiritual connection, whether they believe in spirit or not. If someone is inspired, then they have this feeling of oneness, whether they believe in oneness or not. So it's a magnificent tool for everyone. So that means go towards whatever inspires you with, with all of your heart, soul, and might then. Well, two things. One is, yes, you know, follow what inspires you. But also, the more we develop the third eye, the more simple things that we didn't think would inspire us do. I give the example of a plate of food that when we experience deeply all the hands and all the effort that brought the food to us, we can be inspired or we can just eat it unconsciously, not realizing what's before us. 
What does the third eye have to do with attunement? Well, the third eye is the center of spiritual perception. And attunement is blending our conscious mind with our spirit. So when we perceive from the spiritual view, then the process of decision making, which the third eye is the key to good decision making, becomes natural. What does that have to do with renting an office on Newberry Street for $200 <laughs> a month? Um, well, you know what I try to do in my own life is live my life looking through my forehead. And I've been working on this a long time, and I'm good at it, but I am not always perfect at doing it. But when I moved to Boston full time, I knew I needed an office. And when I lived in the country, I had a home office. So I needed to find an office and I wanted it to be in walking distance. And I happened to live in an expensive neighborhood, but I didn't have a lot of money for my office budget. So in the process of following my third eye, it's sometimes I say it's like following the bouncing ball. This is kind of dates me, but in my meditation, I asked about um, about my office, and I and I heard that I would rent an office for two hundred dollars. And I talked to um, a real estate agent who laughed at me because you can't get an office on Newbury Street in Boston for two hundred dollars a month. But I thought I would because that's what I heard, and it ended up that I. I used someone's office for a little while and then an office became available and I asked if um, a door could be filled in. So I have the smallest office in this magnificent building and they charge per square foot and it ended up being $200 a month. And I think the, the point is that, you know, we culturally get caught in this idea of what's a norm. Mm -hmm. You know, this is what we can expect because this is the norm. You know, after I had the spiritual awakening with my mother, I dropped out of college and my father was a professor. I came from an academic environment that was considered a cardinal sin. But I didn't um, not get an education. I got a thorough education, but it was unusual. And I remember when I left school, um, the trustee of the school said, your ideas are great, but you're going to find you can't make a living unless you go through the normal route. And I said, we'll see. And it's not been a problem. So I also want to encourage people that when you use deep listening, when you connect with your spirit, when you use your third eye, you don't conform. And you also don't rebel. You have this deeper attunement to what's right for you. And so I have a lot of unusual stories in my life of how things have unfolded in the process of not conforming to society, but rather letting spirit be my guide. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You actually, you have a beautiful, beautiful uh, question in your book that can help guide all of us. Given what is, what am I to do? Yes. So my guides emphasize acceptance of what is, look at what is, don't avoid, and then ask, given what is, what am I to do? And then the decision is made through deep listening and deep focus. Beautiful. What advice would you give to parents today for their kids? Well, I'm actually working with a woman who's taking my Wisdom of the Chakras book and the basic concepts there into elementary schools. Cool. So uh, we call it a framework for wise education mm -hmm. because I see the chakras as a uh, framework for human development. And so I guess I would say, you know, you might want to get my framework, my, um, my wisdom of the chakras book, because it's about helping children stay inspired, helping children to learn the power of focus and concentration, helping children recognize that their behavior is not their identity. Their identity is deeper and their behavior is the stage of development. And also in the heart chakra to not encourage competition, but cooperation. And also to help heal emotional turmoil by strengthening focus and concentration skills 
and also encouraging um, the parent to say, who is my child? Not how can I um, direct them the way society says, but if they're a spirit temporarily on the earth, how, why have they come here? What are they here to learn? What are they here to contribute? You know, I'm a parent and my kids were young. The fundamental question of which disciplines and skills do you help them acquire by meditating and using the third eye to really understand who your child is, it helps you to see, you know, whether you encourage a child to learn a certain language or whether you encourage them to learn a certain instrument. And so it's this process of deep listening. And I was taught to listen through meditation to the spirit of my children, to let my children guide me in how to guide them. And then, of course, the importance of discipline, giving them some really strong skills. I think that kids have an easier time in adolescence when they they have skills because that's part of how they identify, you know, I'm good at playing the guitar or I know how to speak French and it gives them a sense of identity in the world. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And there's, I'm thinking of a couple things. We don't have time really to dive into both. We'll go into the second. First was you have a very different style than your daughter who came into the world and you found it was, it was like bamboo smacking against each other until you learned that she came in, who is she, a different way and you were able to then work with her. And then your son, if I get this right, you helped him to learn how to work with his third eye by focusing on the, the flame on a candle. Actually, it was my daughter who focused on the flame of the candle. And um, I tell the story of, I think my daughter was either in middle school or high school, I can't remember, but um, she was upset about things that were going on in school. And so I had her stare at the flame of a candle. And when she did, she was a wise sage and she calmed down her emotional turmoil and she knew exactly what to do. And this focus and concentration is, I mean, it's amazing. We have wonderful stories in the elementary school that we're bringing this material to where, where kids just become so incredibly wise. One of my favorite stories was giving a lecture about the TAD technique and this young man who was high school age with dreadlocks and his pants were sort of falling down and his underwear was sticking up and he was kind of, I wish, you know, he was just kind of a um, rebellious teenager. Yeah. And he came up to me after I taught the tad technique and he said, when I was in my third eye, I wasn't angry. And he said it over and over again. When I was in my third eye, I wasn't angry. And I could tell in the solar plexus, he thought he was just an angry person. And what he learned was it had to do with how he was focused and that impacted how he perceived and that impacted how he felt. So I would (laughs) love to, to help large numbers of people understand the power of the third eye because we are a classic solar plexus culture and it's causing all kinds of problems. I think you've given us a new a new title for today's show, The Power of the Third Eye, because this is extremely powerful. It is. It so really is. from there, I want to do a brief meditation at the end, a few quick wrap-up questions. First off, one we like to ask all of our guests, what personally brings you the greatest happiness, or what I call the woohoo factor? The, or what I call the inspiration, right? Perfect. Well... I think it's when I'm actualizing my spirit, you know, and sometimes that happens when I'm teaching and sometimes it happens when I'm alone and sometimes it happens um, with my husband or it's this feeling of, of interconnection. It's a feeling of wholeness. It's a feeling of, I know who I am and I don't feel vulnerable to what's going on around me because I feel this, this inner core strength. Beautiful. 
So from there, where can people go to find out more and to find your beautiful book? And there are a lot of great books out there. I've read quite a few books for this show, but your book doesn't just have a tremendous breadth, but what it has that's unique is the amount of depth. And that is the time that you took away, unplugged, and got something special for this. So it is rare today that I get that much new in any one book. Your book did it, and I love it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. You know, the journey to this book has been a long process. Woohoo! So what's, <laughs> what's your website? My website is simply ellentad.com, and my name is spelled with two Ds, T-A-D-D. So, and if you didn't catch the links, come on over to inspirenationshow.com. We'll get you over to Ellen as well. So before we do a brief meditation, any last words of wisdom you want to share with people today? Well, I think it's important to recognize that we're alive in a challenging time. We're alive in a challenging time because... Um, our world is stressed environmentally. Um, a lot of decisions have been made that uh, expose us to toxicity, and uh, we have, you know, a variety of problems that are important not to ignore. And so, to me, positivity doesn't mean ignoring our problems. Positivity is recognizing that in the midst of our human challenges, we are spirit and accessing the spiritual principles and the wisdom that comes from them are what we most need to do in order to navigate. And I think that this is a time where people are going to be searching for deeper answers. And this is the beauty is that it will bring people more to a spiritual perspective. Woohoo! <laughs> Okay. So, so would you mind sharing then your meditation technique with us? So when I teach meditation, it's not so much a relaxation exercise as it is um, an interactive process. So I define meditation as the ability to still the brain chatter. Mm -hmm. And this is a discipline like learning to read. And the... The three approaches I take in order to achieve this um, starts with inspiration. So the crown chakra in the chakra system, which is at the top of the head, is the bridge from the material to the spiritual dimension. And it's through this crown chakra that we're able to access the spiritual realm and have direct revelation. In religious pictures, it's the golden halo. And what opens the crown chakra is trust, devotion, and inspiration. And I find that inspiration is the easiest way to open the crown chakra. So before you meditate, if you want to have direct spiritual connection, you must open the crown chakra. It's the door to spirit. Depression, my guides say, is a closed crown chakra. It's depressed in the aura, and when the crown is open, it's expanded. So before you start to meditate, focus on what inspires you. It's different for different people. So you have to make your own little list. It may be a memory. It may be a concept. It may be a person. It's amazing that, you know, I can think about a time I was at the ocean, you know, decades ago, and it still inspires me. So focus on what inspires. Once you feel this open, airy feeling at the top of the head, then you're ready to begin. The next step is affirmation, a positive affirmative statement. And the purpose of this is a couple fold. One, to create a positive environment. And two, to focus on one phrase as training wheels to get to no thought. So the process of staying with one thought. So often when I teach meditation, I have people start with, I am spirit, I am infinite spirit. I am spirit, I am infinite spirit, to create positivity, to remind us, and to practice saying one thought. Then the next step is to let go of the thought. And when you're learning, it can feel like a, a rocking sensation. I am spirit, infinite spirit, pause. I am spirit, infinite spirit, pause. 
you want to elongate your pauses as you can. Some people have trouble and they just have to practice saying one thought without interruption. And gradually the pauses become in, become part of the process. But what's important is to not be what I call a sloppy meditator. Because if you're having a lot of brain chatter, you're not going to get the depth of direct spiritual connection. And some people think meditation is is, you know, having thoughts and letting them go. Well, that's okay. But I'm more rigorous when it comes to meditation training, where I really want people to get to the point where they sit with no thoughts, because that's when the really remarkable experiences start to happen. That's when this real positive force is experienced. And you start having connection with the spirit within, the spirit without, guides and vision and all kinds of wonderful things happen. But meditation is a prerequisite in most cases. How long? It varies from person to person. I often have my students meditate deeply for short periods of time because I want people to get insight, to have experiences and then get on with integration. So I'm not a big proponent of meditating for long periods because we're here to learn to bring the spiritual qualities into our human life versus stepping away from our human life. So I think that question varies. You know, it can be 15 minutes, it can be 20 minutes. It depends on the person. But the most important thing is to create the discipline to create the habit. So when I first started, you know, I meditated at a certain time in a certain place every day so I could build the skill. Now I, I can just not think when I want to not think. So I have the skill. So I can use it as a skill throughout the day when I need to attune. Woohoo! <laughs> Thank you so much. And, and uh, I would encourage everybody, try this technique and, and try working with your third eye. And I'm a strong believer of making things a habit. So I, I, I'm guessing you would agree a little bit each day, but keep practicing and get the wiring down. Yes. And so I think it's better to have consistent practice than it is to practice for long periods of time. It's better to, to develop the consistency. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Well, thank you so much for being on the show, Ellen. This has been a true joy and a treat, and you're the real deal, and I am so honored to have you on the show. I can't <laughs> say thank you enough. Well, and thank you so much for offering me this platform and for encouraging people to learn about my book. Thank you. Thank you very much. You are most welcome. So for everyone out there, this is Michael Sandler saying, be well, have fun, get the infinite view, and open your third eye, and shine bright. Woohoo! <laughs> Thank you, Ellen. Thank you. Well, you're talk about shining bright. You are shining bright. I need my sunglasses. <laughs> wow. Wow, wow, wow. What another amazing, sacred, special interview. On that note, if you want to dive into something that's sacred and special, then you want to dive into awe, the automatic writing experience. It's a process where you learn how to channel, to go quiet, put pen to paper, and literally get answers from the other side of the veil. Now you can get our video-based program where you can begin learning automatic writing today along with live classes at automaticwriting.com. On that note, if you're loving the show, then that means you are a mystic. So join Michael School of Mystics. We meet four Wednesdays a month. Simply go to inspirenationuniversity.com and you can find Michael School of Mystics. On that note, come join us every Monday night. We have YouTube live events. And if you want even more than that, click the join link. Come join the inner circle with me. You get an uplifting dose of goodness in the inner circle with all of the behind the scenes footage and videos that I make specifically for you. We're a podcast too. Find us on iTunes, Spotify, every single place you can get a podcast. You can find the Inspire Nation show. Click the subscribe button and the bell icon, which will notify you with upcoming shows, YouTube live premieres. And here's the link to the next amazing video. Love you guys so, so much. Big thumbs up. Leave your comments if you like this. Shine bright.
Woohoo! Love you guys.